William Wilberforce, the philanthropist who fought for the end of slavery. William Wilberforce dedicated most of his life to come to a compromise with the King of England over slavery, which was finally granted to him in the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. He was born on August 24, 1759, in Hull, Yorkshire of England. Wilberforce's drive to abolish slavery was mainly from Evangelical Christianity, to which he converted to in 1784. Wilberforce was an only child to his parents, Robert Wilberforce and Elizabeth Bird. When his father died, he was sent to live with his uncle, William Wilberforce, and his aunt, Hannah Wilberforce. Eventually, his grandfather and uncle died, leaving him very wealthy. In April of 1737, Wilberforce met Barbara Ann Spooner. Within a month of knowing each other, they were married. Together, they had three children. Robert Isaac Wilberforce, who lived from December 19, 1802 to February 3, 1857. Samuel Wilberforce, who lived from September 7, 1805 to July 19, 1873. And Henry William Wilberforce, who lived from September 22, 1807 to April 23, 1873. Wilberforce started school at Hall Grammar School when he was seven. When he was 17, he went to St. John's College. His final schooling was done at Cambridge University. After he got out of college, he decided to pursue a political career. He became a candidate for Parliament. During this time, he met one of his good friends, William Pitt. Pitt went on to become Prime Minister. Then, Wilberforce started on his long journey of campaigning against slave trade. When approached by the early abolitionist Thomas Clarkson, who lobbied him to take the anti-slavery cause up before the House. Clarkson's horrific evidence detailing the cruel trade of slavery moved Wilberforce into action. On October 28, 1787, Wilberforce penned these memorable lines in his diary. God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. The movement had found its champion. Later that year, Wilberforce brought a motion to the House of Commons for the abolition of the slave trade. It would be 20 long years, 20 years filled with frustration, duplicity, and disappointment before he would carry the House of Commons and the House of Lords in putting abolition into law. After much consideration, on March 13, 1787, at a dinner party, Wilberforce announced that he would be willing to be the leader of the parliamentary effort to end the slave trade. He immediately sprung into action using his position in Parliament. He wrote to his friends in government and made sure Clarkson could look at files and records related to the slave trade. A little after Christmas of 1787, Wilberforce gave a notice to the House of Commons of his wish to end the slave trade. Around February of the next year, Wilberforce felt dangerously ill. As him and his doctors thought he was going to die, a hundred petitions from abolitionists were sent to the House of Commons. Wilberforce also named Pitt as his successor to lead the cause. Pitt acted immediately and sent Sir William Dolben, a member of Parliament, aboard a slave ship. Horrified by what he saw, he made a bill for limiting the number of slaves that a ship should be allowed to carry. The bill had an impression on the house. That spring, Wilberforce recovered and made his most famous speech ever. May 12, 1789. When I consider the magnitude of the subject which I am to bring before the house, a subject in which the interests, not of this country, nor of Europe alone, but of the whole world, and of posterity are involved. And when I think, at the same time, on the weakness of the advocate who has undertaken this great cause, when these reflections press upon my mind, it is impossible for me not to feel both terrified and concerned at my own inadequacy to such a task. But when I reflect, however, on the encouragement which I have had, through the whole course of a long and laborious examination of this question, and how much candor I have experienced, and how conviction has increased within my own mind, in proportion as I have advanced in my labors. When I reflect, especially, that however adverse any gentleman may now be, yet we shall all be of one opinion in the end. When I turn myself to these thoughts, I take courage. I determine to forget all my other fears, and I march forward with a firmer step in the full assurance that my cause will bear me out, and that I shall be able to justify upon the clearest principles every resolution in my hand the avowed end of which is the total abolition of the slave trade. 
I wish exceedingly, in the outset, to guard both myself and the house from entering into the subject with any sort of passion. It is not their passions I shall appeal to. I ask only for their cool and impartial reason, and I wish not to take them by surprise, but to deliberate, point by point, upon every part of this question. I mean not to accuse any one, but to take the shame upon myself, in common, indeed, with the whole Parliament of Great Britain, for having suffered this horrid trade to be carried on under their authority. We are all guilty. We ought all to plead guilty, and not to exculpate ourselves by throwing the blame on others. And I therefore deprecate every kind of reflection against the various descriptions of people who are more immediately involved in this wretched business. Though his speech made an impact, he was not able to convince the House. Wilberforce worked for many more years trying to convince the House, falling sicker as the years went on. In 1806, Pitt fell ill and died. Wilberforce was heartbroken. After Pitt died, his cousin, Grenville, took over as Prime Minister. Wilberforce did not like Grenville at first, even though Grenville was a pivotal figure in the end of the slave trade. On February 23, 1807, Wilberforce's long work finally came to an end. As the House of Commons erupted in cheers for him, Wilberforce just sat and wept. It was a moment like, unlike any other in British history. The House of Commons rose as one man and applauded for several minutes on end Wilberforce. And he sat there with the tears streaming down his face. The historian G.M. Trevelyan has said, speaking of the abolition of the slave trade, that it was one of the turning events in the history. From 1807 till his death, William Wilberforce was a George Washington for humanity. Everywhere he went, people anticipated his arrival. He was the nation's conscience. At the beginning of 1823, all that Wilberforce wanted to do was end slavery for the people in Britain's West Indian colonies. Wilberforce worked extremely hard on this. Many people were open to this idea. He was overjoyed to see how far abolition had come. On July 28, 1833, Wilberforce's health deteriorated greatly. The next morning at 3, he died. His last words were, I do not venture to speak so positively, but I hope I have. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, where the greatest Britain citizens are buried. Many memorials were held in honor of him. William Wilberforce is so important today. America's founding fathers were inspired by him. If not for Wilberforce, the whole world could possibly still be fighting slavery. He relates to the theme, conflict and compromise, because slavery was a big conflict and Wilberforce spent most of his life fighting for the end of it. He finally came to a compromise with England's government and won in his lifelong fight. William Wilberforce was truly a great hero. Wilberforce speaks to us so powerfully because he is probably the best example we have of someone who carried his faith into the public square to write a great human rights abuse. And he is one of a, a great tradition that we're familiar with here in America. One thinks of Martin Luther King Jr. and his passionate pursuit of civil rights. Faith was the basis for Dr. King's pursuit of social justice. The same is the case with Wilberforce. Like Dr. King, his faith was the source of first principles that inspired him on the fight to end first the slave trade and later slavery itself. <laughs>